tank. Oh yeah? <laughs> the tank is a rock. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit I'm here with Tony and we've got the 27 litre Rolls-Royce Meteor engine. It's been a little while but we're hoping that we can give you at least maybe half an hour to an hour of entertainment between Chrissy and New Year's and um, you know a warm welcome to all you guys in Europe and Britain and where it's really cold at the moment and everyone locally in Australia and the subtropics where we have some nice hot weather and rainy days happening. Um, today we're just going to rip straight into it. Tony what are we going to do first? We've obviously got a rig set up here you've just finished yeah, so last the other bank, the other cylinder bank uh, that we took off, we tended to strip it right down, like all these accessories. I've left them on this side because we'll strip them down as a sub-assembly later. Um, so, uh, but it'll all come off as, as a cylinder case and cylinder head as one unit, like the other side did. This side, we didn't have the problem that we did with the other side. We had to fight a bit with the other side. So these saddles sit on top of the cylinder head and the nut on, on the stud, except for on the end four studs, where it's just a, a like a, a dome nut or a nut with a cap on, cap on and a uh, flat steel washer. And on the other bank, uh, for some reason, it had crushed the, the aluminium on the cylinder head onto the stud. And it took a while for us to actually relieve that around the stud to get it off. We, went, we explained that last time. Yep. This side here, not a problem at all. I've taken all the nuts and saddles off, uh, put a heel bow under either end here, and it just, just freed up straight away. So we're ready to come straight off with this one now. Yeah, I can see you've cracked the, yeah. the gasket down yeah, the bottom. Just, it's starting to weep yeah. a little bit, which is yeah. a good sign. Yeah. So, Tony, we've just got a couple of little nuts to do here on the no, shaft case. Or, no, that, or can that, that, stay that on? bevel drive shaft for the camshaft, I've taken the bevel gear off and the shaft out. Right. And now the tube at the bottom is just an O-ring seal by the look of it into that case there. I'll just move it and you'll see it. Oh, you yeah, see. So that can come that up. Now. Yeah, that can come up with the, uh, with okay. the cylinder case. I'll just move it and you'll see it. Oh, yep, okay, yep. It's yeah, it's moving for out there. Good. So. All right, so we can start putting a bit of tension on the crane you've rigged yeah, up we'll, and yep, just start we'll just lifting, I guess. Ease it up, um, you know, both sides. So I'll give you a bar. Thank you. There we go. I'll go this in. Oh yeah, that's, that's almost that's freed up both of yeah. then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just keep walking it up like that. Yep, yeah. so that's releasing from the crankcase now, the bottom of the cylinders. You can see it. Yep, look at that, it's just, it's just coming out nice and free. We haven't lifted this before, this is the first time it's coming up. I think you're in maybe a little My bit My tube's up. out. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yep. Oh, that's coming up good. Just come on, pull yours up a bit. Uh, I've got to go come, up my end of it. I'll come down, yeah, I think you I'll, I'll come down a touch. That's it. it is slightly unbalanced, so I'll lift this yeah. up as you go. I wish the first one went like that. That oh, was what, uh, yeah, ninety seconds work. Not not really any any problem there at all. That one. I was curious how that um, cosmoline went into the cylinders and where it coated and where it didn't. But we'll see that in, in more detail when we lay it down or we'll get the head off. Anyway, we'll look at that later. All right, very good. What do we think this weighs, Tony? Oh, it's not that heavy. It wouldn't be that heavy, it would it? doesn't feel that heavy. I mean, you could probably pick it, pick each end up yourself. There you go. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, maybe 50 it's a, kilos, 60 kilos yeah, max? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
And what are we left with over here? This is a we've obviously got to be careful of our rods and pistons sitting here. We'll yeah, make sure we, we buffer some those. Paper around yep. um, and just protect it. And then I think um, well, I'd like to um, just do a you know a bit just a basic visual, but uh, we'll come in here and have a look at this. There's a whole build up of that <laughs> yes, cosmoline. That's there. where they've because yeah, they've sprayed it in through the spark plug holes in the cylinder heads. Um, it's tended to build up on the side that they've been the opposite side to the spray. It's like a, mm. a wax. But I, I haven't seen any rust or corrosion anywhere. No, other than the wear pitting on those followers and cam loads we saw earlier on. Yeah, that, there yeah, hasn't been any signs there, of anything, that's, has a, it? that's a running wear yeah, problem, but yeah. not a corrosion wear. Yeah. Problem, yeah. yeah, these rods look brand new if you look yeah. at them. So there's been no moisture at all over the years. And just, just roughly now, so you'll be, you look, we're looking for something obvious like skirt pickup and things like that. but. It all looks pretty good and they all slid out pretty easily, so I don't expect that there was any problem. Looks fine. Yeah, so now we're looking into the crank drive assembly itself down there at the, the, the rod contacting area with the, with the crank. It all looks very nice. Everything's all fully machined. These rods are fully machined and I assume they'd be. Uh, and I tried it as well, they look like they are. You can see the split pins on the castle nuts on the Conrod bolts. Uh, yeah, the machining mark here is, uh, so the, just obviously where they have machined it, like you said. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say they, they would have been fully machined and then they would have been um, uh, probably uh, shot peened for stress relieving on the, on the surface and then they probably were nitrided as well. Okay. The, extra hardening on the surface but I could be wrong I, I mean I haven't read everything yet so I'm not sure but it's typical the my back engines I used to work, work on that was the procedure for those and any surface rust on those rods de deemed them to be scrapped which was a shame but uh, yeah that is a shame seems yeah. to be a waste of a good yeah, yeah. Well but these skirts component. look good uh, we're looking for an obvious reason we want this to run again so obviously we're just looking for you know components that are in usable condition there's some there's some marks here on that, but I can't feel any scoring. I think they're just like a like a wear mark on that one there. No, they're, they're all very similar. No, I think this will be fine. Okay, so are we going to try and roll this over now and expose the the sump, and we might try and take it off? Yeah, I think that's probably See what a good it looks idea. like underneath. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. We we'll get that get the sump off and have a look from the other side. So we've just wrestled around and flipped it up. We wish it was just as simple as pulling the engine apart, but we've got to deal with the fact that it's big and heavy and awkward as well, but this has helped a lot. So we're just going to leave it at 90 degrees and pull the oil pan off from this angle. That way you guys can see a little bit more and we might just sit down on a couple of milk crates and start pulling some of these fasteners apart and see how much of this we can get off. Um, yeah, so let's get some tools and do that. All right. here just with a hole through that that nut mm -hmm. just tying that off to that pipe so we'll cut this and unwind that and what have you got a bracket down that end of this pipe here do you Tony for yeah what we've got is uh, this pipe runs over here and then it um, it's one piece of bracket that's going through the engine mount where we're supporting it onto the onto the frame, onto the rotator. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> I thought it'd be a pipe clamp half that you could separate, but no, it's actually a part of the actual bracket. Right. So if we loosen this off, can we wriggle that out of the way? Let's try it, yeah. yeah. We'll probably end up just taking that that one off. So I believe this is one of the um, the oil pickups out of the sump. Or the only one by the look of it. So you can see the sump, it's a flat bottom sump with a with a well at this end here to 
obviously for this pickup to collect and then you know, off to the pump. sitting in there like that with just enough clearance to, to the bottom in here and at the, so it's picking up the lowest point. So it's coolant? No, it's oil. There's okay. a little bit of, it's like, there's some water in there. Okay. That would have settled in the bottom. Well, that's the first water we've seen so far. I'll try and crack this nut here then. I can't hold it. Hang on. If it can, can you fit over that? Probably won't get on it. No. I'll just see what just it see, does. See how much total tank. Yep, there he goes. Okay, that's free. So that's coming from the oil pump by the look of it, which is potentially pulling oil from the pan or to uh, the filter. Possibly. Yeah, I'd say to the filter. To the filter, yeah. from the pump to the filter. And the filter was actually on uh, one of the rocket covers, Lawrence, remember the? Oh yeah, that was, yeah, the yeah. canister lived yeah. up the top, doesn't yep. it? Yeah. I think that still, filter is still in that housing somewhere. Yep. We can pull it out and look through it later. Yep. Can you get a socket on that, Tony? I tried to get this ring spanner on and it doesn't quite clear the pan. It might have to. It might have to be an open-end spanner job. Well, that's going to be painful with this many nuts, so I might just uh, to slip a little bit off my socket, it'll go on. On the lathe, I'll just turn it down a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, yep. You want them? Uh, it's a bit hot, but um, let's see if that buzzes off. Well, it fits some of them anyway.
So that was a little little pump there, there's a little tang drive for it there. You can see a castle nut that locks on and a ball bearing in there. So so well done, you know, like they don't do things with little simple bushes and things, there's all bearings everywhere, proper ball bearings or all the bearings. That's the main engine oil pump at that end, isn't it? That well, does everything yeah, scavenge. Yeah, that, that pump pressure. was just on that line that was uh, feeding out. Now, looks like under here, these cap nuts are a little unusual on the bottom here. There, there could be some, there may be, um, I could be wrong, there could be relief valves or something like there could be an adjustment here with them, maybe. Not sure. But obviously, this is the main oil, oil pump assembly here. Maybe that runs other outputs as well for the supercharger, if that's in place, or do you think? Yeah, well, it looks like you've got another, there's another pump um, driving off this side here. You can see that where there's one drive on one side, you can have it on the other side. It's a bit like the, um, those camshaft drives. Okay. Crank yep. drive here. Yep. So, gear case inside here, driving all these accessories, you know, like the fuel pump's here, one either side. Um, you know, there's that oil pump here. This is a larger pump, so yeah, smaller pump, like you said, could have been not on this engine, but maybe on an aero engine, there would have been you know, a completely different arrangement for, for the supercharger lubrication, I assume. Yep, yep. Mm. Well, this mm -hmm. is a, another sort of castle nut here on the bottom of the pan at this end, which I've just managed to get off. I have to remove it to get to one of the nuts, but right. Okay, it's an access. That's a steel. It's yeah. Okay. Cup. Yep. Looks like there's a timing mark actually. Here's all your here's your timing indicator. Ah, That's right, what okay. it is. Do you want to get right. in there and have a look at that, Tony, with the light, and maybe we can make sense of that a bit more before we move anything. You'll see a little oh, yes. triangle tang yep. with some numbers on there's the. A, there's a pointer there, and you can see the the teeth on this end rotating around, and then you have probably got indicators. Well, there is some kind of a mark there, actually, yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, on that mark there, there's a couple of letters. There's a B and a D. There's an A, B and a D, C. Uh, so something to do with top dead, bottom dead setter, maybe? A bank, B bank? Yep, we'll find out. Yep, yep. So, yeah, I guess from underneath, <coughs> there would have been an access hole in the belly plate under the, under the engine area, under the engine compartment, I guess. Yeah, so it's a decent hole. So you can, on this yeah. angle, you can see quite a bit. That's right. They would, you have, are. they would have had to build in the access into the into the hull of the tank to get access into that that area for maintenance. Here we've got a coolant pump. Then we had our distributor, uh, our sorry, our magneto drives throughout the side. We've got a fuel pump either side, and we had our camshaft drive bevels coming up from here, and then slightly lower down, we've got the these drives coming out to these oil pumps. So you've got so much being driven from this, this gear case, it'll be really nice to get inside here, Lawrence, and, and yeah. see, see all that in there. It'll be like a Swiss watch, but on steroids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's going to be really interesting to get into here. Yeah, well, between this, the updraft carburetors and the intake manifold, the magnetos, there's so many subcomponents that's, that we need that's, to go through. I was just going to say, I wouldn't mind uh, suggesting that... Uh, this sub-assembly would have been assembled in a, you know, another department, a, another department already for, for unchecked and backlash and shimmed and you name it, everything, everything. Run a test on them or yeah, yeah, possibly, and then that is that complete assembly is then then loaded on. As it is, they may have fitted something like the coolant pump later. Who knows? But uh, or the fuel pumps. But uh, it'd be interesting. Would have been interesting to see the actual plan because you know efficiency was the main thing, but reliability is the other thing too. It's got to be. It's got to be right, but it's got to be done efficiently, so I'm going to have to take a bit, a bit more off this, Lawrence. I'm going to take a bit more, a bit more yeah, just buzz it off quick. So the clearance they've given these nuts onto the side of the sump here is quite tight, so we just, they're not too bad, we're just getting it with an open ender, but we just wanted the socket on the, um, on the cordless to be able to speed it up a little bit, but that's okay, we're in no hurry. <laughs> And this, this feels and looks to be aluminium here. I've just sprayed this old gasket area here with a little bit of um, heavy uh, lanolin to, to stop any fibre coming off. Uh, because these old gaskets are likely to contain asbestos. 
So if we keep keep any airborne fibres coming under control, it keep us all safe. Oh yeah. Good. Just in case we ever have to do anything, Lawrence, and calculate things. Oh yeah, you've got a Here's one I prepared earlier. An analog device here somewhere. <laughs> so here's one I prepared earlier. A lot of the fellows that are, a lot of people that are watching uh, this video will clearly understand what this is. But a lot of younger people would have, would look at it and go, what is that thing? <laughs> what is it, Tony? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's basically a, a calculator, and depending on what's what you're calculating, you can do all kinds of conversions and calculations. You can see there's quite a lot of scales here. So you've got a central slide rule here. You've got a moving cursor. Therefore, that line is the cursor. Therefore, the name everyone knows a cursor on a computer. Well, this is the early version of the cursor. It was the sliding line. Okay. But even on the back, there's a couple of conversion tables on this one, on the side here. You know, they'd crammed as much as they possibly could onto this little calculator. It's a little bit hard to focus in on some of that stuff. Apologise. Oh, that's all right. I'll so, put it on the bench. But yeah. if we're out in a vehicle, if ever this goes into some kind of vehicle and we're stuck somewhere and, and we need to, you know, look back at our calculations, Lawrence. Yeah. Well, if we go for a trip across Australia and in some sort of buggy. Yeah, field, then we can pull out the, the pocket version of the slide rule. Okay. <laughs> I bet you there's a, a pocket version. Right. Yeah, well, just in case. <laughs> and we can do a couple, a couple of quick right. calculations with the, with the pocket version. There you go. I'd never, I'd never seen a pocket version before. I'd never seen one. Like, I've seen plenty of old films and fellas use old slide rules, but I'd never seen a pocket one. I saw this one and thought, oh, Where did you pick that up that's from? pretty neat. Oh, I've had it for a while sitting at home. Just... But yeah, it's, it's interesting to consider how things were made, how, they, how the concepts came up, how the, the ideas came up, the, the prototyping. And well, the they way. say that if you pull F1 engine from the Saturn rocket, they say it can't be built again. The people that built them were involved with the designs, even though it's all written on paper and there's records of it all, it still requires that ability of it going together correctly for it to work. Yeah. And it was the difference between them blowing up and, and, and getting yeah, well, into space. That's right. And that was just that person assembling and the tolerances and... The calculations would have been, you know, really complicated. Uh, to go through the whole process of designing something like that. So interpreting them and... I'm oh, just wondering these days, children at school are learning maths and they, you know, they can go quite deep into maths these days, you know, as far as you want to go. And I'm, I'm wondering if some of those kids are actually wondering, why, why do we need to learn this? Yeah. Why? Because we can just punch the information into a, a computer and it'll, give, it'll do it for us. Well, we have our phones on the source. If you don't have a phone on you, you can tap shoulders with the person beside you and get them to pull their phone out yeah, yeah, and yeah. you can find out anything. That's right. Why do so, you need a brain anymore? So it's, it, it's actually encouraging to see that there are young people, brilliant young people, that are really involved heavily in studying maths and understanding mathematics. That was my favourite subject at school. That's why you wanted to work on Rolls-Royce <laughs> engines. <laughs> work out how they were designed. <laughs> Frank Whittle. If, if Frank Whittle had been taken more seriously earlier on, then we probably wouldn't be working on this yeah. now. Oh, I don't know about turbines in, in tanks, but I mean, turbines are in tanks now these days. A lot of different engines would have worked in the tank, though, realistically. Yeah, and yeah. This was almost a, let's just try it in a tank, I believe. It wasn't designed for a tank initially, I, was it? The engine itself. I, I, I'm not sure. People, people watching will know more um, as far as the facts go, but... The early American versions of the, I think it was the Sherman or the early one, had a radial engine in it. Okay. It actually had a, like an aircraft derivative radial engine in the tank. Now there was a, uh, I think there was something about a shortage or there was some kind of power problem or reliability. I'm not sure what the problem was, but there was a need for a, a, a conventional, um, not a radial engine. Um, and I'm pretty sure it would have been air cooled, I guess. The radial. Yeah, yeah, I assume, but people will, will obviously make a comment if you know more about that, that engine, that American radial. 
Um, and then the, there was this issue about a reliable tank engine for the new generations of tanks that were being designed. Because I think the Grant and the Lee were the early versions that they, that they were using, but um, there were shortcomings. And uh, I think the story went that um, there, was a, there was a V12, I think, or a, or a 10, or a Ford engine that was shortened down to a V8. But it ended up producing, I think, somewhere around 500 horsepower. And the British tested it, and the Americans wanted to promote it. But I don't think it, uh, it met the requirement. Because right. it had to fit into a certain space inside the... Obviously, they, they all have to fit into a, you know, a compact space in the, in the tank. So it didn't make the power right? No, it didn't. I don't know whether it was just power. I think the reliability issues with it were significant. Um, and I, hot, maybe? I don't know, but I think the only time that they became reliable, from D-Day on, I think, they were used reliably in the Shermans on the continent. But before that, I don't think they were, they were a, good, uh, a good option. Right. But that's where the Meteor came to its fore early on, because the Meteor was already a reliable, and it was down, you know, um, sort of, you could say detuned if you like, and it had enough power and it fitted in the space. So it was the one to use. It was available and it did the job, so that's why they, they produced them in number. Okay. I've, I have been interested in the Sherman V8 tank, the Ford one. I did watch something about it. I've forgotten most of the stats about it, but it doesn't seem to be a lot of them around. No. Not as many as these that I've seen. Too. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And you know, I think the British, um, I think that, that that peak of the tank was when they got to the Rhine. I think they released the the version of the British tank, the Comet. I think it was. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know more about that tank actually, because I think it was mounted. They had, I think they mounted that three point seven inch um, uh, British gun on the on the Comet. And I think the three point seven. I saw a documentary relating, they did a comparison or someone compared the 88mm uh, German gun to the 3.7 British gun. And the British gun uh, fired um, a heavier shot faster with a faster rate of fire um, in an anti-aircraft um, configuration. So it had a higher, higher ceiling uh, hit rate. So the 3.7 was, was something to really to be, to be uh, to be looking for as far as an anti-tank gun goes, if you can mount it in, the, in a turret of a tank, which I, which they finally did, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to get some. Because the 88 has that reputation as being the, you know, the. The enemy gun. That... <laughs> Take this one gun to, into the fight, and it'll do everything, sort of thing. You know? Yeah. But, um, maybe it had something to do with the mountings too. Like the mountings of the 88 might have been more versatile in the field, you know, things like that. So. Right. Yeah, we'll probably try and learn a bit more about the facts of the uh, actual artillery that was fitted to these. Yeah, it sort of it sort of relates. It relates to the because everything because the engine's got to drive everything. It's got to move the vehicle, and also uh, I think well there there were exa there were there were auxiliary engines for other other purposes in the tank, like for turret um, um, powering things like that. So, but as we go on, we'll learn more. Yeah, yeah put it, put it in the video. Yeah. I've just taken these last few washes off and we can start to see if this pan wants to move from its gasket. Is there everything else off yeah, as far as you can as see? As far as I can see, unless there's anything dowelled here around the pump housing, um, it, should, it should lift off the studs and, and maybe move away. Well, these bolts, these screws screwed into this housing here and this is a, just a blind hole covering. Now, it could be a dowel and I might just get a, need to get a little pin punch in there and just, back, back. just back it out. Mm. It could be what it is. We'll just see. If it doesn't move off this end, then we'll know. We're just going to back those pins out. So if we come in and have a look here, there's just a few washers and nuts here, just to hold an oil pan on. I can't see any sort of, you know, slots in there to put a, put a lever in to release the gasket. Let's 
just sort of around here. We've got to try and mm. that vertical seal is going to be a lot of tension on that. Mm. Got it. There we go. It's moving. Yep. straight onto this crate with it. Nice, all right, look at that. Well, there's just sludge, you know, along the, along the bottom over here, around the side. I can't see any metal flakes or anything, so no, no yeah. bearing failure evident. This is all the Bit of water in that. See how it's a bit milky, it's a bit sort of milkshakey. But other not not a great deal. Like it's it's pretty minimal really when you look at it. That's just ordinary sort of sludge around there. That um, that baffle pan unbolts so we can take that off and put yep. it in the spinner and clean it all up. Yep. I'm just sealing this with a like a light preservative oil so we you know no issues. It's all the deadly fallouts now contained. Right out. You can see, uh, depending on the position of where the crank pins are, you can see there's a disc, like a cup, inside the crankshaft here, and there's a nut there. And there's one on the other side as well, and there's a bolt. So the bolt goes through, and it seals the, these cups both sides here, because the crankshaft is drilled um, through here. You can see the diameter of the cup, and also through the mains, you can see another cup here in the, in the main area there, with a, a nut in, on the inside. So, uh, that drilling would have been for lightening of the crankshaft, but it also allows the oil to flow, you know, through these sort of chambers in there. We'll, yeah. we'll go through that again when we get it apart. And yeah, yeah, you'll in see. In fact, it. we can put the the crank up on our rotator, can't yes, we? If yeah. we hold it. Yep. Yeah, you can see that. You'll see that later. It's quite a large bore um, that they've drilled out through the the crank pins and the mains, and then they've put those cups in there, those steel cups, and they just bolt in. They just clamped in, held in like that. They look like just a little half inch nut holding them in there. Yeah, yeah, it's just a small bolt. Yeah. That, uh, so that's in the centre of the main bearing, the centre of the centre line of the crankshaft. And uh, yeah, that's probably one of the one of the big ends there. You can see the castle nut with the split pin. Oh, is it a split pin? Yes, there's a split pin in there. Yep, see the castle nut there, and there's the one in the main. You can see the split pin in the in the main there. So all that drilling was to light, lighten the crankshaft and, and then the overall weight of the engine, obviously for an aircraft engine, that would have been a great benefit, you know. Yeah. It probably wouldn't have mattered, you know. They could have just done um, direct shot oiling or cro even cross drilled it um, and left it solid for the tank application, but uh, maybe that meant another design and another specification, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so... Um, take the, you could take the blade off first because it runs on the outside. Of What's it. the best way? Take the centre one out? Yeah, you yeah, have to take the blade, yeah. the blade has to, or they actually Rolls-Royce don't call it a blade, they call it a plane rod. This is the plane rod and this is the fork rod. Okay. Whereas the Maybach translation, uh, uh, it was a gabel and messer, which means a, a, a fork and a blade rod. So the centre one was just being a single piece, they call it a blade. Okay. But Rolls-Royce just call it a plane rod. <laughs> pin at the bottom there to locate the, the bearing and there's also a tang up, up the side there as well and it's, it's got a little skirt or a, a flange on it as well it sits over the side of the cap there as well. Got it. A little bit more. Why would just 
fell off. Mm. It's funny, there's no tang. There's a tang slot in the rod, but... Interesting. So, this is our plane rod. And, yeah, like I just said before, we've got a dowel um, cap, and the, there's our dowel hole in our lower bearing. This looks, it almost looks like a bronzy copper. Yeah. Colour, doesn't the actual bearing material would be interesting where it was. The exposed surface. Mm. And the upper rod with no dowel. And again, there's a tang. <coughs> cut out, but there's no tang on the bearing. Um, and we've got these flanges or skirts on the side of the bearing to locate it, uh, which the tang would have done if there was a tang. So that just um, locates the bearing in the rod. And we've got, got cutouts on uh, oil slots on the side here, on both halves. And that is our plain bearing, plain, uh, plain rod, and our plain rod bolt. Hmm. Nicely, fully machined, wasted shank sort of bolt. Beautiful. Now, these bolts have dimples uh, for stretching if, they, if that's how they are tightened. You can see there's a countersunk here. It, it could have just been for manufacturing that they needed to centre it. Um, but we'll, yet, we'll find out if they were um, stretched when they're tightened or whether they're just torqued to a, a torque value, a twisting value. What's up inside that piston head? Anything worth noting that you can see up in there? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, lots of numbers under the piston pin boss. There's a government, <laughs> government issue arrow here. You can see, unless it's a direction, but it looks like a Commonwealth, uh, like a, an arrow. That's a typical... Um, a typical arrow you'd see for government property, but oh, okay. But uh, oh yeah, there it is. It's very faint, but on this side. The uh, oh yeah, I can read that. There you go, Repco. Yeah. There's an R circled EPC. And that's the old, the old. Oh, with the, 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 the lines the coming off the top. top. Yep. yep. Well, I'm convinced it's a Repco brand piston. Yeah, well, it says Repco. If mm. you can't see it on the on the camera, yep. you can definitely see it here clearly. Yep. That right is line. the old old Repco logo. What does that mean? So does that mean Repco have made these pistons? Yes, or? yes, it does. So Repco, uh, when they were in their in their beginnings and in their heyday, had various foundries uh, for engine component production. And it was decentralised. They realised that was the key to their success. Don't don't invest all your capital in one in building up one site. Uh, uh, they bought other foundries and just um, kept them operating in those locations. Okay. And that's the way to keep going and make profit sort of straight away. Yeah. So they've uh, they obviously achieved a contract to supply pistons. So made in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That is an Australian-made piston for a Rolls-Royce V12 armoured vehicle engine. <laughs> There you go, so we're all more involved than we thought. For everyone that doesn't know, we don't make a lot of things in Australia anymore. Our manufacturing industry's been slowly in demise for quite a few decades, for various reasons. Uh, some are quite obvious. Uh, but in the heyday, we used to make a lot of things in Australia with a with a quite a quite a uh, well a much smaller population than we do today. So it's sort of we used to even make automobiles here. A lot of a lot of automobile factories. There's not one here now today, even though our population is much bigger than it was in the past. So that's a shame. Mm. It'd be good if they change that again one day. Yeah. Oh, good. So we got some Repco pistons in our V12. Um, obviously, we can just go ahead and pull the rest of these out. But I think what we might do is just take that dirty old oil pan out to the hot wash and see if we can get it cleaned up so we can store it. Yep. We'll clean up these fasteners that we've taken off and. Um, yeah, I think we we might wrap it up today, Tony. Yep. We know what we can come and do next, which would just be pull the other 11 pistons and rods out, pull the accessories off the front and rear of the crankcase, and then lift the crank out. And then we're getting pretty close to finishing pulling this thing apart. Yeah, the sub-assembly sub components will, will need further stripping, but uh, 
that's the main core of the engine then stripped. Well, what we want to be able to do is we want to get the block clean, crank checked, serviced, rods, pistons, probably do a bit of a balance of everything and just see where it's at out of interest before and after. Mm. And try and improve that a little bit. Um, and then get the core long engine going back together and then we can take care of the accessories secondary to that. That's going to take some time and might be quite tedious so we don't want that to hold up doing the juicy parts of the engine. But yeah, the idea is to get it back together and, and somehow run it yeah. and not necessarily put it in anything or do anything with it but get it back on here and run it. And we also would like to throw a few other engines in between the journey on this one. We'll get it fully pulled apart, find out if there's any other hidden surprises so we can do some homework on getting parts for it. But so far it's looking pretty good. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I can't help but look at this rod and think how beautiful a piece of uh, a steel this is. For, for the era that it was designed and manufactured, it's just such a beautiful conrod, um, you know, for an engine of that era. You know, two big ribs around the cap here to keep that nice and keep it, keep the shape, maintain the shape there. Look, it's just beautiful. It's fully machined. You've got a tapered uh, I-beam shape here. Uh, we've got at the top, you can't see it, but I can feel a nice big hole there on that side of the top of the rod and another hit, a hole here. And that's for lubricating the small end bush. Um, it's a fully floating gudgeon pin and you can see the taper in the end of the pin. So it's not just a solid cylinder, there's a taper at the end of the gudgeon pin and that's to reduce weight okay. of the pin. But also maintain, maintain the rod strength that was required for it. So it's fully floating in the skirt and the rod. Just a, it's just a nice, it's just a really nice combination for, for the era, you know. For, for Compare for that to a... Early 1940s, uh, this is just fantastic stuff. And there's our conventional V8 road car piston and rod. Yeah. Just as a comparison, give a bit of scale. That's yeah. out of a S63 4.4 litre twin turbo BMW V8. Mm. And that's... Yeah, there's the size comparison, yeah, but... But, uh, uh, well, this rod impresses me more than that one, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> just because of you know, the, the way it's been machined and, and made and the shape. And just shows my age. All right, well, let's get this pan washed up and we'll go for a bit of a walk outside. We've we'll got a couple of other things to show you. <laughs> some of these. As you know this is a channel about big engines and we we'll call it Now We're Talking for a reason. We've got a few other engines to talk about. We've had these for quite some time. So over here we've got a bit of a I guess a graveyard of old diesel truck engines or marine boat engines. This one here is a lot of you will recognise as a straight six. She's an old Detroit GM engine, 671. So it's a 71 cubic inch per cylinder, straight six cylinder engine. Um, that one came out of a fishing trawler, I believe. I picked it up from just a, a coastal area in New South Wales, along with this guy here, which is also a 71 series two stroke uh, diesel engine. This is an 8V71, so it's a V8. As you can see, the heads are off it. It's been sitting out in the weather for many years, I think 30 years. It's been exposed to sea weather and salt corrosion, 100 metres from the beach. An old 871 blower or supercharger on here, which people put on their muscle cars. You've probably heard of the 671s and 871s. That's the blower off these engines. So we're gonna try and strip this down and uh, make it run again. Here we've got a couple of our Caterpillar engines, which are two of my favourites. These are C15s, one's out of a 2900 loader engine, so for underground tunnels and mining. This one's out of a, a, a truck or a highway truck. Um, I think this one's out of a Freightliner, both 15 litre six cylinder engines, diesels. One of my favourite sounding engines in a truck. So we're going to pull these guys apart and 
rebuild them and make them run. So yeah, we're going to try and fillet these things in between some of our up and coming episodes of finishing off the strip down of the V12, which is nearing completion. If you guys have any interest in these or any comments, we'd be interested to hear who likes Detroit's GM's Caterpillar. Um, in the shop, we've got an old radial engine that we're going to pull down one day and introduce that as well. Obviously, it's taken us some time to get through the video with the V12, but as we progress, we want to try and introduce some of these guys and show a bit of our other interests. All right, I think I've heard the hot wash uh, just finished, so we'll go and check out and see how it's cleaned up this oil pan from the V12, and we'll finish off. That's cleaned up real nice. We're back to the original paint. We'll give that another spin and just give it a rinse and we can put that into storage. Everything looks really good in that. All right, so that's it for this episode. It's a bit of a quicker one than usual but we just wanted to get something to you and hopefully it'll make your New Year's Day a little bit more enjoyable. Sit back and have a beer or a brandy and a cigar and let us know what you think and we'll get this thing pulled apart hopefully in the next month and get it all washed up and crack on. See you again soon and have a good holiday.